Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the composite of two fields. Okay, so, we're now going to discuss my claim 2, which is going to expand our understanding of the composite of two fields even further. Okay, now, claim 2 is going to have the same um, assumptions as claim 1. So once again, we're going to assume that K K1 and K2 are both field extensions of some even smaller field, capital F, and that they're both finite field extensions over F, and that they have these bases. Okay, but we're now going to explore at the result of this even more. Okay, so we've seen that the composite of K1 and K2 is equal to the field extension of F generated by V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. Now let's have a look at another claim about the composite of K1 and K2 uh, with these uh, setup assumptions. Okay, so let me firstly put the title as claim number two. Okay, so claim number two concerns um, a set which is going to span um, the composite of K1 and K2. Okay, so claim two whoops, is that if we take the set of all things of the form VIWJ, okay, where I is allowed to equal 1, 2, all the way up to n, and um, j is allowed to equal 1, 2, all the way up to m, okay, if we take this set, my claim is that this is not a basis necessarily, but that it does span the composite of k1 uh, and k2, so that my claim is that this spans the composite of k1 and k2. So remember, the vectors v1, v2, all the way up to vn, those were a basis for k1 over the initial field, capital F, and the vectors w1, w2, all the way up to wm, they were a basis for k2 over f. So now what I have done is I've multiplied all of these basis vectors together. So I've taken every possible combination of uh, the two of a basis vector from the basis for k1 and a basis vector from the basis for k2, and I've multiplied them together. Now remember, of course, that addition and multiplication uh, is always the addition and multiplication that's in the largest field, capital L. So this makes sense to multiply these two elements together and get something else that's in capital L. And my claim is that this set that we have here, okay, which will certainly have to be in k1, k2 here, the composite of k1 and k2, because uh, this will have to contain all of the uh, vi's and all of the wj's, and therefore it will have to contain all the products of them. Okay, my claim is that this is going to span the composite of k1, k2, and I should actually put over f, so when we view k1, uh, k2 as a vector space over f, so f linear combinations of this are going to span k1, k2. Now I will repeat again that I am not claiming that this is a basis of K1, K2. It might be, but we cannot, we're not going to prove that. That's a stronger condition. We're just going to prove that it spans the composite of K1 and K2. Okay, and from this, there's another little corollary, a nice little corollary that you can get. So corollary of claim 2, if you like. Okay, so the corollary of this, and we'll prove it in a moment, but I'll firstly state the little corollary of it. Uh, the corollary of it is that if you consider the degree of the composite of k1 and k2 over f, then, of course, um, it's going to have to be less than or equal to the number of vectors that we've got in here, because this is just going to be the size of a basis of k1, uh, k2 um, over f. And of course, any basis of the composite of k1 and k2 over f is going to have to be smaller or equal to the size of a spanning set. So this is a spanning set, so the size of a basis is going to have to be less than or equal to the size of this spanning set. So this is just basic linear algebra, okay? Uh, so this is going to be less than or equal to how many vectors we've got in here. Now, how many do we have? Well, there are n possibilities for the vi here, and there are n possibilities for the wj, so this is less than or equal to n times m. Okay, so we can always conclude, therefore, that the composite of k1 and k2 is going to be uh, nicely finite over f, but, and we can even bound it in this way. We can say that it's going to be less than or equal to n, which is the degree of k1 over f, times m, which is the degree of k2 over f. Okay, so there's a nice instant corollary 
from this claim here. Okay, right. Uh, so, what we're now going to do then is we're going to try and prove claim 2. So, how are we going to do this? Well, it's going to follow a sort of similar argument to what we used uh, in claim 1. Okay, it's slightly more difficult, but it's not, uh, it's not a difficult argument by any means. Okay, so proof of claim 2 here. So, how are we going to uh, approach this? Well, firstly, what I want to prove is that if you take... Uh, well, actually, if you want to construct the um, composite of K1 and K2. We have so far proven that this is actually equal to the field extension of F generated by all of the basis vectors V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. What I'm going to find incredibly useful for proving this is the statement that the composite of K1 and K2 is equal to the field extension of K1 generated by the basis vectors of K2, so W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, okay? This is going to be a really important statement for proving this. So I'm firstly going to just argue that this is true, and then we'll use this to prove this. Okay, so let me firstly explain to you why this is going to be true. Okay, so uh, it's probably actually wise to copy out the picture that we had on the other side because uh, that will help us understand this. Uh, so I'll just firstly draw out my largest field capital L here. So here is L, and we'll have L once again coloured in green. I can remember that at least L was in green. I uh, probably won't manage to match the other ones. Uh, then we'll have K1 and K2 here. We'll have F as the smallest initial field here, the field for which K1 and K2 are both finite field extensions of. Okay, so here's F. Then we've got K2 here, and then we've got K1 here. So let's just colour those in. So we'll have K1 in in red here, like so. And we'll have K2 here in purple. And we know that the composite of K1 and K2, the way that we previously showed that is just as this square here, the smallest field extension of K1 and K2, which contains both of them, and uh, which of course is a subfield of capital L. Okay, right, so what I now want to prove is that this is what you would get if you try to extend K1 so that it includes all the basis vectors of K2, which are basis vectors for K2 over F. Okay, so these are all in K2. Okay, so that's the statement that I'm trying to prove here, so I hope that's now, uh, you've got an intuitive understanding of that in terms of the picture. Let's now actually prove this, and this follows the exact same proof strategy for what we use to prove that the composite of K1 and K2 uh, is equal to the field extension of F generated by all of those basis vectors in claim 1. Okay, right, so how are we going to do this then? Uh, so we're going to firstly show containment one way round and then show containment the other way round. So again, we'll start off with the easy way round. The easy way round is showing that uh, the field extension of K1 generated by W1, W2, all the way up to Wm is contained within the composite of K1 and K2. Okay, so what makes me uh, capable of saying that? Well, of course, the definition of this is that it's the smallest field extension of K1, uh, which contains W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. So you have to look at all the field extensions of K1, which contain all of those elements, intersect them all together, and that will give you uh, this field extension of K1 generated by W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. This is a field extension of K1, certainly, which is also going to contain all of these basis vectors of K2 because it contains K2, and therefore it's going to contain all the basis vectors for K2 over the field F because they're all just elements of K2. So certainly this is a field extension of K1 which contains these, so this is one of the things that's going to be intersected together to make this, and therefore we can conclude that this is contained within this. So that's the easy way round. Now to prove that the composite of K1 and K2 is going to be contained within the field extension of K1 generated by W1 and W2 all the way up to Wm. Okay, so just like we did in the previous example in claim 1, to prove this, all we need to prove is that both K1 and K2 are contained within the field extension of K1 generated by W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, like so. 
Okay, because if we can prove that both of these are contained within this, then this is a um, subfield of L that contains both K1 and K2, and therefore it's one of the things that we will intersect together to produce the composite of K1 and K2, and therefore we'll be able to conclude that the composite of K1 and K2 is contained within this. Okay, so how can we prove, therefore, that K1 and K2 are both contained within this. Well, one of these is obvious. The fact that K1 is contained within this is obvious because this is a field extension of K1. Okay, so all we need to worry about is, is K2 contained within this? And this is going to follow the exact same argument that we used uh, in claim 1. Okay, so how would you construct this thing, then, the field extension of K1 that contains W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. Well, firstly, all of these elements are going to be algebraic over K1, because remember, I could say that they were algebraic over the field F, and K1 is just a field extension of F. And um, that means that if these are algebraic over F, they're certainly algebraic over K1, because remember the definition of algebraic is that there's a non-zero polynomial in the ring of polynomials over that field, uh, which has this element as a root. Uh, okay, so if there's, so for instance, just taking an example, if we want to show that W1 is still algebraic over K1, there's going to be some polynomial, which we'll call P of X, in the ring of polynomials over the field F, such that W1 is the root of that, if W1 was algebraic over F, which we argued that it was uh, for the proof of claim 1, that polynomial is still going to be in the ring of polynomials over the field K1, uh, because this is just a field extension of F. Okay, so any polynomial where the coefficients are all in F is still going to be within the uh, ring of polynomials over the field extension of F, which is K1. So indeed, all of these elements, not just W1, all of them, because they're all algebraic over F, are still going to be algebraic over K1. And that means to construct this, all we need to look at is the ring of polynomials over K1 in the M indeterminates this time, X1, X, whoops, X2, all the way up to Xm. And then what we need to consider doing is evaluating all of these where we let x1 equal w1, x2 equal w2, all the way up to xm equal wm. Take all of the answers which are going to be in the uh, field capital L, okay, collect them all into a set. You will certainly get all the elements of k1 because of all the constant polynomials here, okay, so you'll end up with an extension of k1, okay, you will end up with a field. Uh, because of all the arguments that we've done in finitely generated field extensions. I can't prove that here. Okay, it requires a huge amount of proof, but we've argued all of that in previous videos, starting with the field extension video, then progressing to the algebraic field extension video, and up to then to the finitely generated field extension videos. We've proven that this will end up with a field. And of course, um, you um, don't just go on and on uh, with these higher and higher degree polynomials getting new answers, eventually it'll loop back around and it'll all work out beautifully. Okay, so this is how you construct this thing, and what I want to show you is that you are going to get all of the elements of K2, just like I showed you uh, in claim 1. And the reason, of course, is that we can consider the polynomials of this form, so A1, X1, plus A2, X2, plus all the way up to AM, XM. That's a perfectly valid polynomial in here. And the AIs can all vary over K1, so they can certainly vary over the subfield of K1, F. Oh, again, that's all I actually need them to be able to vary over, but really they can vary over K1. Okay, but uh, for our purposes, I only need them to be able to vary over F. Okay, uh, so I can look at all these polynomials, which are certainly going to be in this ring of polynomials here, and then when I evaluate them uh, in this way, so when I stick in for x1, w1, stick in for x2, w2, all the way up to xm being, get, having m, wm stuck in for it, and then of course you change the meaning completely, the additions become additions actually in the field L, uh, the multiplications become multiplications in field L, the taking to the powers uh, become taken to the powers in the field L. Of course, what I'll end up getting in this case it's just all the linear combinations that I would like. Okay, so I'll get A1, W1, plus A2, W2, plus all the way up to AM, WM. And of course, this means that I can get any element of K2 I can possibly dream up of. 
but because I know that these are basis vectors, it's an F basis for K2, okay? Uh, and I ha now have every possible linear combination uh, of these basis vectors for K2 over F uh, with coefficients of F, so I can get any element of K2. So indeed, this thing will contain all of the elements of K2, so I can conclude that K2 is completely contained in there. So that's just a revision of the argument that we saw uh, earlier on. Now, if K1 and K2 are both contained within the field extension of K1 generated by W1, W2, all the way up to Wn, then of course, this is a field, uh, well, this is a subfield of L which contains both K1 and K2. So in the definition of the composite of K1 and K2, you'll have to intersect this with all the other uh, subfields of L that completely contain K1 and K2, and then you'll end up with the composite of K1 and K2. So you can conclude that the composite of K1 and K2 is going to be contained within this. So truly, we can conclude then that the composite of K1 and K2 is equal to this field extension of K1 generated by W1, W2, all the way up to Wn. Okay, so we've proven that. Now, how are we going to use the fact that this is true in order to prove this is true? Well, there's one further thing that we need to show. Okay, we need uh, to understand this in even more detail because this is even more beautiful than you can possibly imagine. Okay, here comes my next sort of subclaim, if you like. Usually people call this a lemma. Okay, I might use that word. So here we go, a little lemma in the middle. My next thing that I'm going to need in order to prove this. Okay, right, so lemma. Uh, so this is absolutely beautiful, is the lemma, basically. These elements that I'm using as the generators for this field extension of K1, my claim is that these are actually a basis for the um, composite of K1 and K2 over K1. Okay, so I'll write this down. So my claim is that the set W1, W2, oh, sorry, not a basis, not a basis. Um, my claim is that they span the composite of K1 and K2. Okay, it's not quite that strong, and that's actually the reason that this isn't going to end up being that strong. If if this was a basis for uh, the composite of K1 and K2 over K1, then this would be a basis for the composite of K1 and K2 over F, which it isn't necessarily. Okay, so, um, sorry, uh, uh, this is weaker than what I just said it was, but I'll write it down correctly now. Okay, so the set of vectors W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, my claim is that this spans, okay, uh, K1, K2, the composite of K1 and K2, over K1. So if you take linear combinations of these in K1, you will get everything in the composite of K1 and K2. That's my claim, okay? So we now need to show that that is going to be true, and that's going to lead us almost instantly to the fact that uh, this set up here spans K the composite of K1 and K2 over F, because then, of course, I can just take the coefficients, uh, which are elements of K1 in linear combinations here, and say that, okay, um, K1, uh, the basis for that is V1, V2, all the way up to Vn over F, and just stick that in, and you'll get the final result. So proving this gives us the um, claim to Okay, right, so let's prove this. This Everything hinges on this being true. Okay, so now let's take our formula back up here that we've just shown. So what we know is that the composite of K1 and K2 here is the field extension of K1 generated by W1, W2, all the way up to Wn. And I have given you an understanding of what that actually means. We know from our understanding of finitely generated field extensions how to actually construct this thing. Okay, we've talked about it here. What we will have to consider is the ring of polynomials in M indeterminates. So the ring of polynomials over K1 in the M indeterminates, X1, X2, all the way up to Xm, being evaluated in this way, where you evaluate X1 as W1, evaluate X2 as W2, all the way up to Xm being evaluated at Wm. Okay, now, if it's going to be the case that all of the linear combinations uh, where the coefficients are in K1 of W1, W2, all the way up to Wm makes this entire thing here, then we need to somehow prove that all of the stranger, more complicated polynomials uh, in W1, W2, all the way up to Wm can all be reduced to these, i.e. they're going to give the same answer as these. Okay, so understand but 
the way that we'd have to build this. We'd have to go through every single polynomial here, and the polynomials in here could be incredibly complicated. Okay, so the arbitrary monomial in a polynomial would look something like this. It would have a coefficient, which was an element of k1, so I'll just highlight that in. So a is going to be the coefficient in front of the monomial. That would be an element of k1. And then the monomial would look something like this. And I'll actually write it in w1, w2, all the way up to wm, since we're going to evaluate them at that. So it'll be w1 to some power alpha 1, w2 to some power alpha 2, all the way up to um, wm to some power alpha m. Okay, and we could end up with polynomials with lots of these incredibly complicated monomials all summed together. And what we somehow need to prove is that all of these really complicated polynomials in W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, when you actually evaluate them in L, you just end up getting a linear combination uh, where the coefficients are from K1 of W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. Okay, so why is the question? Why is this going to be true? Okay, well the reason that this is true is that W1, W2, all the way up to Wm are the basis vectors for K2 over F. Okay, so remember, uh, these were the vectors in B2. Okay, so I'll just remind you of this. So they were the vectors W1, W2, all the way up to Wm which were a basis for K2. So what does that mean? That mean, meant that any element in K2 could be written as a linear combination uh, of these uh, elements um, where the coefficients were from the field capital F. Now, K2 was a subfield of L, okay? Up here, it was a subfield of L. So in particular, it was closed under multiplication. So what you could do is you could consider what these sort of things were in K2. So it makes perfect sense to consider W1 to the power of alpha 1, W2 to the power of alpha 2, all the way up to Wm to the power of alpha m in K2. This makes sense in K2. Remember, this is the important thing, that in all of these different subfields okay, of L, the addition and multiplication is always exactly the same. Addition and multiplication is always just as it is in L. That's the beautiful thing that you need to appreciate here. Okay, which is why uh, this thing that we we're considering now in the, you know, in the this thing that we're generating here, okay, which seems distantly related to the subfield K2, it's perfectly valid to think, okay, this was something in K2 because the addition and multiplication is exactly the same. Okay. So this thing, you can work it out in K2, okay, because W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, they're in K2. So you can raise W1 to the power of alpha 1 and multiply it by W2 to the power of alpha 2, etc., all the way to this one, and it will be some element of K2. But we know that anything in K2 can just be written as a linear combination of these basis vectors where the coefficients are from at the field F. So I can write this, therefore, as, let's say, B1, W1, plus B2, W2. There will exist some um, coefficients here from the field capital F such that this is true, that I can write this like so. B1, W1, plus B2, W2, plus all the way up to Bm. Wm, where now these Bi's are from the field capital F. And that's the ingenious step here. It means that these incredibly complicated monomials that I'm considering uh, when I'm looking at all the polynomials in this ring of polynomials over K1 in these M indeterminates, and then evaluating them at W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, they're not actually that complicated at all. I can take these complicated monomials and reduce them now into an f-linear combination of w1, w2, all the way up to wm. So all of the monomials in any polynomial here, when I evaluate them at w1, w2, all the way up to wm, I can just substitute now in a beautiful f-linear combination of w1, w2, uh, all the way up to wm. So imagine now taking this, this is the green portion here, and all I now need to do is stick that coefficient a in front of it. So I'll put that now there. a is an element of k1. Now I can apply distributivity, because remember, multiplication and addition is always just in L. L is a field, so distributivity applies. And then what I'll end up having to do is multiplying all of these coefficients by a, which, remember, is an element of k1. When you multiply an element of K1 with an element of F, of course, you'll end up with an element of K1 back again, okay? Um, because 
all of the elements of F are in K1 because K1 is a field extension of F. So effectively, this is just multiplying two elements of K1 together. So all of the coefficients are going to end up being in K1. Okay, so these massive great polynomials are just going to end up with all of the monomials just being these linear combinations in W1, W2, all the way up to Wn, where now the coefficients are from K1. You'll just have to add all of those together. There's going to be a finite number of them. Just add them all together, and of course you'll end up with a linear combination where the coefficients are from K1 uh, of the basis vectors W1, W2, all the way up to Wn. So I hope I've now convinced you that when you build this thing and you have to consider evaluating every polynomial here at x1 is equal to w1, x2 is equal to w2, all the way up to xm is equal to wm, you're not actually going to get that many answers at all. All of the answers you're going to get are just going to be of the form a k1 linear combination of w1, w2, all the way up to wm. And therefore anything that's in here it's just going to be a K1 linear combination of W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. And that's exactly what we mean by saying that the composite of K1 and K2 um, is spanned over K1. So where you have uh, the coefficients from K1 by these vectors W1, W2, all the way up to Wm. Because of course K1, K2 is equal to this thing. Okay, so I hope you understand why that lemma is true. Everything truly in the composite of K1 and K2 is equal to a K1 linear combination of W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, and this is the reason why. Okay, right, so now let's consider that further and arrive at the actual proof of claim 2 here. So anything that's in K1, K2 can now be written as a K1 linear combination. I'll write this out. A1, W1 plus A2, W2 plus all the way up to a, M, W, M, where now all of these AIs are elements of K1. So anything that's in there can be written as a K1 linear combination of W1, W2, all the way up to W, M. Okay, now all you need to do is acknowledge that K1 was this finite vector space over F. So all elements in it, all of these AIs, could be written as linear combinations of the basis vectors for K1, which are the basis vectors V1, V2, all the way up to Vn. If you now substitute those in, and I don't know where to do this, I'll go down to here. I'm sorry for jumping around a bit. Okay, so for instance, A1 will end up being a linear combination of this form. I'll now have a double indexed A here. A11, V1 plus A12, V2, plus all the way up to A1n, Vn. Okay, and all of that will be in front of the basis vector W1. Okay, and then we'll have plus A21, V1, plus A22, V2, plus all the way up to A2n, Vn, and all of that will be in front of W2. And then it will go on all the way up until we finally have a m1 v1 plus a m2 v2 plus all the way up to a m n v n and all of that will be in front of w m here. And of course addition and multiplication is after all just in the field L so you can distribute this out and then of course you'll see that you get a massive great sum where the coefficients are from f now. Okay that's the important thing to note and in fact I'll write that down. A, I, J's are all elements of F, okay, and these coefficients are in front of some uh, vector V, I multiplied by some vector W, J. Okay, right, so let me just stress exactly how I did this. All I've done now is this thing here was just my A1 previously, which was an element of K1, and I've just written it as a linear combination of the basis vectors of K1, where the coefficients are now from F, so it's an F linear combination of the V vectors, and the same for here. This was A2, written now as an F linear combination of the basis vectors for K1, and the same here. This was A uh, M written as an F linear combination of the basis vectors for K1, and you can do that for obviously all the ones in between as well. Uh, and then you multiply this all out and you will just get an F linear combination of all of the things here. And because of this argument here that anything in here could be written in this way, we now know that anything in here can be written in this way as an F linear combination of all of these uh, vectors here. 
So indeed, this set does span the composite of K1 and K2 over F. However, it is not necessarily a basis, and let me explain the reason why, okay? Although it is true to say that each one of these, the A1s, the A2, all the way up to AM, has only one linear combination uh, of um, the vectors, uh, only one F linear combination, the vect vectors V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, uh, it is not true to say that there was only one in a 1k1 linear combination of w1, w2, all the way up to wm that gave each element of the composite of k1 and k2. Okay, we never ever proved that. We just showed that every single uh, one of these uh, polynomials where you've evaluated at w1, w2, all the way up to wm could be written as a k1 linear combination of w1, w2, all the way up to wm. We never proved that it had a unique K1 linear combination of W1, W2, all the way up to Wm, and therefore we can only conclude that this set spans the composite of K1 and K2 in general, uh, and from that we can conclude that the degree of K1, uh, K2 over F is going to be less than or equal to the size of this, which is N times N. Okay, so we will end this video here. I hope that you now have at least some sort of an understanding of what the composite of two uh, fields is.